love the Lord? I know you do now, right after that song. If you don't love the Lord this morning, we, we got another. We got to get him back up here again. I'll have him come sing again. <clears throat> well, this morning I want to talk to you about God's love and, um, and a few other things, but it start out with God's love and share with you actually about my great grandpappy. And uh, my great grandpappy uh, owned over a 100 acre farm out in Garrett County, Maryland. And yes, there's an embarrassing picture of me on the screen <laughs> that I approved. Uh, that's me when I was a little boy. I'm wearing one of my grandpappy's hats, and he's wearing his hat, and he's out there in the field. We took a picture, and I used to love going out to the, to the family farm when I was a kid uh, out in western Maryland, and one of the things that I always feel like I had a special relationship with my great-grandpappy, uh, I always assumed it was different than everybody else's, and I'm hoping I was right, but you know how kids think. And, uh, but he always took an interest in me when I was there, and he always took time for me when he was out there, and he, and he and I had a connection that I felt at a very early age, and so I knew that he wanted to know me and wanted to be a part of my life, and I knew that he loved me, even at a very young age, and so when my grandfather, my great-grandpappy, as I called him, when he would ask me, hey, Matt, do you want to go help me feed the cows? I would say, yeah, I'll go with you. And when he came to me and he says, hey, do you want to go out in the field and help me get the hay bales up? I'm going to take the tractor out. And I heard tractor, and I said, yeah, I'm going. <laughs> and I remember one day he asked me to go fishing with him, and we got to this lake, and we got in the, and there at the lake he had one of those old metal boats that kind of were real wobbly when you got into them, you know. And I put a light, he put a life jacket on me, and he sat in the boat, and he said, well, come on, get in the boat. And I was like, oh, I don't know about this. I didn't know how to swim when I was like four or five. I'd never been out in a boat before. I was kind of a little scared. But as he encouraged me, he says, come on, take a step out of your comfort zone. Get out of your comfort zone, Matt, and get in the boat with me. You know what I did? I got in the boat. And one of the reasons I did that was because I knew that my, I wanted, one, my great-grandpappy loved me, and two, I wanted to be with him. And so wherever he was going to go and whatever he was going to do, I wanted to go do it too. And I think in my great-grandpappy, I caught a glimpse of what it's like to have a relationship with God. Because God has been saying to us, I love you, I care about you, I'm interested in your life. And that when God comes to me and asks me, Matt, will you do this? Will you go with me here? Will you do this with me? I say, sure, God, I'll do that. You see, Paul has been saying in Romans chapter, the first 11 chapters of Romans, God has been communi- I mean, Paul has been saying one thing through the scripture, God loves you and me. It says in Romans 5, 8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God took the first step towards us. God shown interest in our lives. God came to us and says, I love you. I want to be a part of your life. I'm interested in what you're doing. Will you be a part of my life? Will you do what I'm doing? And that's what's happening right here in chapter 12, because Paul says, in view of God's mercy, what he's saying is, if you read the first 11 chapters of Romans, in view of God's mercy, be a living sacrifice. Respond to that mercy. Respond to that grace. And he's been building up to this. So go home tonight, read the first 11 chapters, because it really sets up this verse right here in chapter 12, verse 1. And that's where he says, therefore, in view of God's mercy, Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. Now, up until this point in time, what had they been sacrificing? (laughs) Does anybody remember from Old Testament temple worship? Anybody remember what they had been offering and sacrificing? Animals, right? That's not cool today, right? We don't don't do that anymore. And so what's happened is, is Paul saying, we're not doing that anymore. We're offering ourselves as living sacrifices now. We're going to offer our lives to God. We're going to serve God. We're going to live for God. We're going to give ourselves for God's purposes in view of God's mercy, in view of God's grace, because God loved us so much that we also want to do what God is doing. And so that when God calls us out of our comfort zones, we say, I'm a little scared, but I'll go. I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do, but I'll go. And if you ask me to do something, God, I'll do it. And that's part of what Paul is saying, to be a living sacrifice is to go and to do and to serve God. The other thing he adds in verse 2 is, to no longer be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So I thought about that. What does it mean to live according to the pattern of this world? What does that pattern look like? 
So I had to begin to think about what are the patterns in our world that we often live in that, that are these patterns of how we use our time and our, what we do with our time. And so I, I put your tax dollars to work this morning. I, you didn't know that, but you paid good money for this next point. All right, you ready? I got this little chart from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. Your tax dollars, I believe, paid for this. And you can see this is how the average American uses, its le- uses their leisure time. And this takes into account the weekend as well. So that's why, you know, I look at that and I go, five hours? I don't have five hours of free time every day. But if you take into account your weekend time and you average it all out over the week, you come up with an average in, for the American average is about five hours a day. Now we all have different, you know, depending on our work schedules, family schedules, different seasons of our life that looks different for each of us. But one thing you notice on here, what is the typical American spending over the half of their leisure time doing? Watching TV, right? Uh, some are relaxing. You also see on now they're playing games on the computer or communicating, socializing uh, through the computer, cell phones, sports, recreation, reading. So it all averages out. This is just an average. But it averages out, and you can see a bulk of our time is spent, you know, uh, just watching TV. So this is a pattern. This is a typical pattern for the average American. So here's my question. What would this pattern look like for a person who was a living sacrifice? How would this pattern look different if you and I are being a living sacrifice? And I'm going to ask you, I'm looking for a response. This is not a rhetorical question at this point. So one word answer, shout them out. What, what, what would look different on this chart? Prayer. What was that? Helping others. Service, Bible reading, worship. I heard one other one. John. Choir practice, practice, right. (laughs) That's right. So how we use our time when we're being a living sacrifice looks different than this. It looks different than this. And we're going to say to ourselves, hey, I'm going to spend my time a little bit differently than the rest of the world spends its time. And all those things are valid. See, here's the thing that happens, though. As we're a living sacrifice, and as we change the patterns of our time use and our behavior, we are transformed. We're changed. We become more and more into the people that God has called us to be as we do that. So we get transformed through this process. So when we study God's word or read God's word, it starts to change us. As we come to worship, it starts to change us. As we serve other people, it starts to change us. As we sing songs, it's not just about the music, but it's about the question, do you love the Lord, as they sang. It starts to change what we sing, starts to change us. It transforms us. And that's the cycle that happens in all our lives. Now, I want to be honest with you this morning. I don't always feel like serving. Some Sunday mornings I lay in bed (laughs) and I'm tarred. (laughs) As they say out in Garrett County, I'm tarred. And I'm tired and I don't want to get out of bed. I'm like, oh, I don't want to get out of bed. I don't want to go to church. My wife's got like, you got to go. You're the preacher. You got to (laughs) go. So I get up and go. I don't always feel like going, you know, and I, you know, there are times when I, 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 I want to serve and I want to help somebody, but I don't always feel like serving. There are times when I don't want to read the Bible or I don't want to pray, but, and I don't feel like doing those things, but I end up doing them. And you know what happens when I do them? I change. I always am glad that I did them. You know, I never go and serve somebody and go, wow, I wish I hadn't have done that. <laughs> I wish I hadn't gone to church today. You know, every time I'm glad that I did that. I'm glad that I got myself out of bed. And you know, half the battle, I I, I say often, half the battle is just getting out of bed. It's just getting up and getting going and going to do it and making a commitment to doing those things. And so we're called to be living sacrifice. We don't always feel like being a living sacrifice. If we're waiting for the feeling to be a living sacrifice to come, well, it's not going to happen all the time. Sometimes it will, but not all the time. But as we do that, we find ourselves changed, blessed, transformed, and blessed because we did that. The other thing that that Paul goes on to say, and I'm not going to go into all Romans 12, but he actually goes on to say and says, when you're being a living sacrifice, here's how to do it. 
Do it in the body of Christ, with the body of Christ, because we're all one together in Christ, and do it in the places that you're gifted. So we serve not out of guilt, but we serve out of giftedness. Paul's saying, if your gift is hospitality, do it. If your gift is teaching, teach. If your gift is, is prophecy, you know, whatever your gift is, use that gift. God's not asking us to use a gift that we don't have. God's not asking us to do something that we're not skilled or strength or gifted to do. God asks us to use our gifts and our abilities and our skills for God's purposes and to find that place where we can use them. The other thing that Paul is communicating to us is that our is not that some people are called to serve or that a select few are called to serve or only the most gifted are called to serve. What Paul is saying is that all of us are called to serve, every one of us. And when we're all serving with our gifts and abilities, there's a powerful thing that happens. How many people here have played backyard volleyball? You know, this is summertime, right? You go to Target and you buy the volleyball set there on the rec, you know, you go through that aisle on Target and you buy the, buy the volleyball set and the, the aluminum poles and you sit up the net in the backyard and they'll say, let's play volleyball. And I don't know, and you get together sometimes and you play volleyball with some people you maybe haven't played with before, haven't gone, you know, don't know how they play volleyball, how good they are, whatever, right? And I, this is what always inevitably happens in the backyard volleyball games is you've got some people who are real competitive like me. And then you got other people who are just kind of out there to have fun, you know. And then you've got other people who aren't real sure about the volleyball game. And so the ball comes over the net to them and they go, hey, um, am I supposed to hit that? <laughs> and they look and they, and they just watch it go by and it lands. And have you ever seen this? Have you all played it? You see this happen, right? <laughs> it just hits the floor and everybody goes, well, who's going to get that? And, and so it happens again and again. And then what happens is the competitive people like me, after that happens a few times, you know what we do? We start stepping in front of them <laughs> and getting the ball because we're competitive and we want to win. And so if you're not going to hit the ball, we're going to jump in front of you. And then what also see happens is that sometimes people do want to play the game and they're trying and they want to hit the ball, but then the ball hawks keep getting in their way, right? Because we're afraid that something's not going to happen or the ball's not going to get hit. And so we jump in. And so the, I, I see this sometimes happening in the church when it comes to service. We got people who go, oh, that's, ball. you know, God sends us the ball and we kind of look at it and just watch it go right on by. Somebody else will do it. Somebody else will get it. Well, I'll wait for a ball hog to come along. <laughs> and then other of us are running around like crazy, sweating, getting tired trying to get all the balls, the loose balls and the miss hits and everything, and we're trying to do it all. And that's not the way Paul, that's not the picture Paul was painting. He says, it, we're all on the same team. We're all on the field together. We're all gifted. We all have something to contribute. And if we're all doing it, if we're all in our position, then it'll work. But if we're in a place of ball hogs and ball watchers, it's not going to work. The best thing that always I learned how to do when I was on those teams is that the person who the ball is coming to, who is going to get the ball, has got to communicate to the rest of the team. And you know what that person needs to say? I got it. Those are great words to a pastor. You know, because a lot of times we're waiting, well, nobody told me to get it. Nobody asked me to get it. So I'm just going to let it go. But the greatest words we can ever say to the body of Christ is, I got this. And you know what the ball hogs need to do? Let them get it. Let them make a mistake. Let them stumble some. Because the only way we're going to learn to play the game is as if we put, make mistakes. So some of us got to be saying, I got this. And others of us have to be saying, let them have it. And what would it look like if we all did that? What if it looked like if everyone had a place of service? See, that's, that's my hope. That's Paul's hope. That's my dream, is that everybody who calls Glenmar home would find a place to serve and say, I got this. I'm going to serve you, God, because I want to be a living sacrifice for you. And I think if we would do that, we can find a place of service. I want to ask you to really think about that for a moment. Think about where are your gifts? Where are your strengths? Where are your abilities? 
and where could I find a place to serve God? And everyone in here has that ability. There's nobody, uh, there's nobody out of this. We may all have different amounts of time that we can serve, depending on our seasons of life and family situations and work situations, but we all can do something for God, no matter what time looks like for us. So I'm gonna encourage you to think about where's your place of service. And I'm gonna offer you that there are some starter positions here in our church. We have some starter positions. I see Brian Meek here this morning. Is it, how hard is it to, I'm waking you up, Brian, sorry. Um, <laughs> see, Brian's one of our servant hogs. He's always out there doing stuff and helping us and he, he you know, so I'm sorry, I'm gonna embarrass you for a little bit. Sorry. How hard is it to do, to uh, help people park cars? Very difficult, Very difficult right? <laughs> yeah. Very easy. So if you can point and wave, smile maybe a little bit. Smile is very important. Wear a gorilla suit. That would be good. So if you've ever seen Brian on Halloween, he's wearing a gorilla suit on Halloween. And so, but what is he doing? He's having fun. He's serving. He's doing something. And he's out there a lot. I have this vision. What if we had a lot of people serving along with Brian and we had different people every Sunday out there doing that? Brian isn't feeling like he's got to do it all. Other people engaging. It's really easy to do. And it's great when it's rainy and cold. I think that's the best time to do it, right? <laughs> I think about greeters. You know, we, how hard, same thing, greeters coming in the door on Sunday morning. All you need to do is be nice to people. I think we all have that capacity. We may not all be gifted at it. <laughs> but we can do it. We can be a living sacrifice. We can sacrifice with our smile and with a hello and we don't, you know, God doesn't want us to stand there and go, oh, there's somebody walking in the door. I don't know. <laughs> it's like, you know, the volleyball's coming, you know. I'm just going to act like that's not there. <laughs> that's not the way to do it. But there you are know, different ways. We have ushers. We have Bob Henry needs counters down. So if you don't like being out in front of people or up here or reading scripture or any of these things, those are all starter positions, too, that you can get engaged in. But if you don't like being up front, there are behind the scenes. We got people back there in our tech tech team. We've got people downstairs counting the offering. They have numbers people just doing the administrative stuff behind the scenes, and they volunteer for an hour or two every once a month, every Sunday. So it doesn't take a whole lot is what I'm saying. But if we all started to do that, to find a place of service, it would just even the playing field, so to speak. And if everybody's in their place of giftedness, they're, they're having joy. And if everybody's helping out, then the burden is eased by all working together. So I want to encourage you to do that. And I want to end with just this question. How are people going to know, especially if they don't have great-grandpappies or don't have people in their lives that love them and care for them, how are they going to know about God's love? You tell them, right? You serve them. You spend time with them. You say, I'm, every time we serve and show interest in another person, we're also revealing that God loves and cares for them, is interested in them. And so if we're, that's not going to happen if I'm sitting at home watching TV. It's only going to happen when I get out and serve. Because not only is God transforming me, but as I serve, God is also touching the lives of other people. And in your bulletins this morning is a people, a person. So pull this out right now. And the ushers are going to help us here this morning. If you need a pen, or am I going to ask you to write something on this? So if you need a pen, raise your hand right now, and the ushers will come and bring you a pen. So just lift up your hand or lift up your person, and they'll come with you, and I'll make sure they get, you get a pen. <clears throat> Pens to my right. You lost a person? Yeah. All right, ushers, can we have another person up here? <laughs> We're missing some people. There's a sermon illustration here, but I'm not going to take the time for that. But <clears throat> there are people missing this morning. They've got one. We had one here and one over here. So here's what I want you to do with this this morning. I ask a question. Who is it that needs to know about God's love? Who is it in your life? Who is it in your community? Who is it at your workplace? Who is it 
somewhere else in our, in our world? Who is it, or is it a group of people, or an individual? I don't know who it is, but who is God putting on your heart this morning? And what I want you to do is just write that on there. Now, as you, before you write it, I want to let you know something. We're actually going to use these in the service next week, and we're actually going to use them as a part of our display and commitment uh, celebration Sunday next week as we bring our pledges to God, because really we pledge and we're generous to our church because it's about people. It's not just about uh, you know, the, the church. What We're being the church. The church is the people. And when we're doing this, we're being the church. And so what we're doing is we're committing our gifts, our generosity to helping people and making a difference in people's lives next week. So we're going to use these to, the worship design team is going to put these all together. And so they're going to be used in the service next week. So if you want to, the reason I'm telling you this is because you might not want to, if, it, if, it's, if you want it to be anonymous, don't write, you know, a person's name on there that you wouldn't want to be known is what I'm saying. But maybe write a coworker a friend at work, or a neighbor, or an uncle, or a, you, you get the idea? Or maybe there's just a group of people, you know, um, single moms, young adults, um, you know, homeless folks in our community, whoever it is that God's putting on your heart this morning, just write that on there, just real simply. And think about who is it that God is calling us to serve and to be in ministry with as a church and as individuals. I just want to give you just a minute to, to write that down. And then after you write it down, um, you can just put it in the offering basket as it comes around during the offering this morning. So you keep writing. The ushers are going to keep passing pens out, and I'm just going to pray. God, we thank you for your gift, your mercy, your grace at work in us. And we come with our hearts open to you, God, to be saying to you, God, we want to be a living sacrifice. We want to serve your people and help other people connect to you. And so as we write these names and these people down today and we pray for them, God, that you would help us to show them your love, to show them that you are interested in them, that we would be their spiritual grandpappies, that we would reach out to them. And so God, use us in whatever ways you call us to serve, in whatever ways we, want, we can serve you. We want to go where you are going and do what you are doing. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.